Well, if you're looking for a different way to pray, our guest this evening has a new book that combines the Psalms from the Scriptures and Lectio Divina. What's that? Don't worry, he'll explain. Friend of the show, Dr. Jim Papadre is a Catholic professor, author, speaker, and musician. He was baptized Catholic but raised Protestant and was eventually ordained in a Protestant denomination. Through his studies of the Church Fathers, he reverted to the Catholic Church. Jim Papadre is an award-winning author, professor of church history and historical theology, and a theological consultant for the EWTN series, The Heresies. That's one of my favorites. Let's go see what the heresies are. His many books have been translated into multiple languages, and he has a significant presence online, including his YouTube series, The Original Church. His latest book is called Praying the Psalms, The Divine Gateway to Lectio Divina, and contemplative prayer. Welcome back to the show. Friend of the show, Dr. Jim Papandrea. Wow, it's great to be back. Thanks a lot for uh, for having me on, and uh, it's great to see your faces. So, Jim, we know that you are uh, an expert in church history and the church fathers, and you love the scriptures, you're a theologian. So you've got a new book about the Psalms, but praying the Psalms, when I saw that, I thought, oh, okay, this will be something I can talk to Jim about, because it's something we do every single day in religious community. In fact, priests and religious actually promise they make a vow to pray the Psalms of the church. But what if, if we just start out this evening with uh, somebody listening who only really knows the Psalms from that part at, at Mass in between the first reading and the second reading where we get to sing a little bit? I mean, what, what do we know about the Psalms? Why are they important to pray? Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing. You know, I've, I've been working on this other book that's coming out in the spring on, uh, on prayer in the early church. And I wanted to look into, you know, well, what, what did personal, private devotion look like for lay people in the early church. And when you, you know, say early, you mean first couple of centuries? Yeah, first yeah. first five or six centuries okay. even. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what you find out is that that um, the, uh, the, the very idea of a private devotional life doesn't really quite exist at the beginning of the church, and it only it develops as lay people are trying to imitate the lives of the the uh, the people in religious communities. The monks, right? Yeah. So, so as you know, they are praying the psalms. Some of them are praying all 150 psalms every day. Um, oh, of course. I mean, I I do that before 7 a.m. There you go. So, uh, I, well, this you is know, kidding. This is me kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do not do all 150. Whew, that's a big. That's a tall order every day. Even yeah, back then, they said, well, maybe we could do all 50 in a week or something. <laughs> right, but right, but exactly. even that seems even daunting. That. And so, right. uh, and so, you know, lay people who could afford to buy a Psalter would imitate the monks by praying the Psalms. And uh, so, the Psalter is like a, a book that only has the Psalms in it, like a New Testament book only has New Testament. The Psalter just means the Psalms, right? Right, right. And of course, back in the day, it would be very expensive to commission someone to hand copy you know, the Psalms. And so not everyone could afford that. So I'm working on this book called Praying Like the Early Church. And I sort of accidentally wrote this other book along the way called Praying the Psalms, because it turned out that in my own devotional life, I had been praying the Psalms for, for quite a few years. And I, I went through them in English, and then I went through them in Hebrew, and then I went through them in Greek, and then I went through them in Latin. And I ended up coming up with my own translation of excerpts of the psalms oh, wow. uh you know based on taking all of those things into account and what i did was is i pulled out excerpts that were what i thought the most prayable you know the psalms can mm. be pretty daunting for the average person mm. and there's a lot of stuff in there that's maybe not as uh conducive to prayer there's a lot of stuff in there where the psalmist is telling god stuff god already knows there's a lot <laughs> of stuff in there where the psalmist is going on and on complaining about you know their enemies or even wishing ill on their enemies, right? right. So I kind of left that stuff aside. Okay. And I pulled out, I pulled out <laughs> only those parts of the Psalms where the psalmist is speaking directly to God, you know, in the second grammatical person, you God, speaking directly to God and praying to God, and uh, came up with a new translation of those excerpts. And and, and that's what uh, that's what became this book. So it's called "Praying the Psalms: The Divine Gateway into the Divine Gateway to Lectio Divina and Contemplative Prayer." So even just back to the ancient church, though, it it was apparent 
unlike some other parts of the scripture. That's why the, the Psalms are kind of carved out themselves. I mean, yes, technically they're part of the Old Testament if we had to break it up into only two parts. But oftentimes we think of really like three divisions of the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Psalms. And yeah, they were written around the time of the Old Testament, but they really are not the same sort of thing. It's not like someone describing what happened and then, you know, like we've been hearing at daily mass and even at Sunday mass. Well, Eli thought Samuel was hearing things, yeah. thought his mom was drunk. You know, it's like everything's going on. The Psalms are really more poetic and likely maybe even they were set to music at some point, right? Now yeah, you're a musician. All, you know these well, things. Well, sure, that's right. And, I, you know, I, I, uh, I have attempted setting the Psalms to music on occasion. Oh. But, I mean, all of that makes them timeless in a way that a lot of the, uh, the rest of the Old Testament isn't in the sense oh. that, oh, you true. know, any of us can pick up the Psalms and we can find things in there that resonate with our immediate experience. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's really how the early Christians started having a personal devotional life was by uh, praying the scriptures. And this develops into the practice of Lectio Divina, as you know, but the point is, is that, you know, the early Christians didn't necessarily assume that they had the right words in their own minds to pray. Right. They they were much more willing to assume that the right words to pray were the words in revealed scripture. And so that's what they did. So when we if we imagine kind of a contemporary and let's say a, a Christian, and maybe some of the background that you uh, the milieu you were involved in before you reverted to the church, where it's much more common to see people what we might call spontaneously praying, you know, doing the old the Pat Robertson we are squint the eyes, you know, like grip your hands and the fists and you're like, oh dear Father God, we love you. Love you, God. Yeah. And, yeah. But, and yet for centuries and centuries, people didn't even think they should do that, let alone like they didn't know or that I, I who who am I to pray? But it was it was kind of like God gives us these words from scripture. We should probably use these. Yeah, yeah. Well it's really true and it's it's so ironic because you know, there's that passage in Matthew where Jesus criticizes those who babble on like the pagans. Yeah. And, you know, the really old school Protestant translations of that of that text say things like vain repetition or things like that, which is not at all in the Greek. And right. so uh, it's not that Jesus was criticizing repetition. He was criticizing going on and on and making it up as you go along and going on too long and making a show of it. And so uh, it turns out, I think that, uh, you know, the, the early Christians, at least, and medieval Christians would have, would have preferred to pray the words of Scripture and repeat those than make up their own prayers a lot. And, uh, and, and I think there's some wisdom to that. And so that's what we're doing with the Psalms. And yet, obviously, a balance between just kind of relying on something outside of me and just kind of, well, if I read these three Psalms, then... I'm done with my prayers for the day. Balance between that and actually genuinely having a relationship with God. But I think that's one of the things you're trying to do with this book, right? Yeah, that's right. In fact, um, you know, we made the decision at the last minute. I'm so I'm grateful for uh, my publisher, Sophia Institute Press, because they uh, I suggested this and they went for it. We put in a bunch of blank pages between each of the Psalms for journaling. Hmm. And so uh, as you pray the Psalms, you can not only uh, sort of make them your own, but kind of write out your own versions of the prayers, write what you're praying for, write down, go back and look later and write down maybe how the prayer was answered. Um, but but the whole, the book becomes a kind of a prayer journal in addition to, uh, you know, having the prayers themselves. Okay, I'm just taking notes for my next book with Paul's Press. Include blank pages. <laughs> right. Makes the book look thicker. <laughs> That'll pad it, Yeah. <laughs> I usually don't have a problem with that. My books are no, usually you... too long. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to pad the stats there? Okay. So if yeah. people were listening to me describe the title of your book, Praying the Psalms, The Divine Gateway to Lectio Divina and Contemplative Prayer, there might be one or two jargony words in there that they might say, help. So what's a divine gateway? What's Lectio Divina? And what's Contemplative Prayer? <laughs> Well, uh, go, go Jim. <laughs> let's talk about Lectio Divina. Great. So okay. Lectio Divina <laughs> is it's just it's a Latin phrase that means a divine reading or or spiritual reading or you could translate it devotional reading and it's simply the practice of praying the scriptures. And so 
while it's very it's a very good thing to study the scriptures and interpret the scriptures this is a different thing this is just praying the scriptures so you This isn't you, bible study. It's not bible study and and you're not looking for some timeless interpretation that you can then go tell all your friends this is what it means, right? What you're looking for is um is is for the text and and through the text the holy spirit to speak and pray for you in the moment. And so, um, so Lectio Divina has the, the just four steps. The first is reading. You, you read wait, a passage wait, of scripture. Before you do that, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but even what yeah. you just described, I think to some Catholics might sound like, oh, because again, you, you uh, spent a lot of years in Protestant denomination. Uh, so I mean, you were a pastor and all that. It's, it, it's more familiar to a, a Bible under his arm Protestant to say, how does this word of God speak to me? We Catholics tend to kind of go, well, I'm going to show up in church and have the priest tell me what it means. So this yeah. is for some people. And yet, we should underscore, this is a timeless and ancient way that Catholics have, in fact, been praying with the scriptures for centuries and centuries. So it is in our wheelhouse, but it might take a little a little nudging for a Catholic to even want to go there. What do you mean? There's not like one right thing to think about it. It's just like how it's moving me to think. Yeah, well, you know, this is one of the things... Uh, that the interpretation of scripture the church has always affirmed that that te the text of scripture has layers of meaning and you know so we so it it's never been a catholic thing to say that if you have one passage of scripture it can have only one meaning and if you get two interpretations one of them's wrong that's never been a catholic thing to say um having said that though it <laughs> is also the case that the that our catholic tradition uh, we do rely on our clergy, on the magisterium, and on our tradition to help us with, you know, anything that we might consider, you know, a, an authoritative interpretation of Scripture. So, so this is not a matter of sitting around in a circle, reading a passage, and everybody say what it means to me. It's, it's really not about what it means to me. Having said that, though, when you're in prayer, and it's just between you and God, Aha. there are going to be passages of Scripture that speak to you in a way that resonate to your situation and in, in that moment and and it may it may never again speak to you in that way if it mm. if you if you feel it today you may not feel it tomorrow mm -hmm. and again you know you're not meant to go preach it uh but there's a way in which and, and you know this is romans romans chapter eight you know saint paul says sometimes we don't have the words to pray and the holy spirit prays for us and in us and and, and so this is how that happens is uh, is by praying scripture. So so we we so Lexio Divina is a way of praying scripture while you read it, not for study, not even to really learn anything other than to to hear the word of God. You know, like people will say this is especially in some circles it's fashionable to say, well, you know, prayer is as much listening to God as it is talking to God. And I mean you got to respect the sentiment, except how do you listen to God if not through the scriptures? Right. right. That's his and word. That <laughs> is how you listen to God is by reading the, the scriptures. So, yeah. Praying the Psalms, the Divine Gateway to Lectio Divina and Contemplative Prayer is the new book from our guest, Dr. Jim Papandrea, Catholic professor, author, speaker, and musician. So Lectio Divina, to me, I mean, how you just described it is similar to when on occasion— after Mass, somebody comes up to me and says, you know, that part in your homily where you said this, I mean, it sounded, Father, like you were speaking right to me. And I, I love when that happens. I love when the Holy Spirit, because I don't know that person. I don't know their situation. I didn't write the homily for them. But the Holy Spirit allowed it to speak directly to them. And I think of what you're describing sometimes when people say that, because so often it seems like they're so surprised, like this is like a once in a lifetime, like this has never happened. And I think what you're saying is, well, the more you do Lectio Divina, you can have that feeling way more often <laughs> that this is speaking directly to you. Yeah, that's that's really true. I mean, the Psalms in particular are full of that kind of stuff. And, you know, let's let's be honest. Sometimes it's because they are poetic. Yeah. And as such, they're open to, you know, a lot of different kinds of application. So, you know, if the Psalm says, gee, God, I feel like I'm under a lot of pressure. Well, there, you know, there's probably a lot of people who can relate to that. Um, so it, it's not necessarily that it's going to get all that, that specific. And yet 
by by praying the words of the Psalms, you are praying the word of God. And so, uh, you know, so so there's there's a, a lot of uh, power there, I think. Well, and so, as you mentioned, you take uh, the 150 Psalms that there's in the scriptures and you don't have every verse of all 150 of them. Neither do we. I mean, we have a lot of them. The, the cycle that we pray every morning and every evening as priests and religious is not every word of every Psalm. And in fact, involves other parts of scripture that aren't Psalms that we usually call canticles, either from the Old Testament or the New Testament. But uh, you've selected some things that seemingly would be lend themselves to this kind of prayerful reading. But also, um, I mean, just in case anybody missed it, uh, when Jim Pop and Dre are saying, well, you know, first I read them in Latin, and then I grabbed the Greek. I see that. And let me get the Hebrew. I'll compare that. And you created your own translation. Now, people might find that odd or scandalous or whatever, but every scripture professor that I had in seminary had to, for their, you know, in order to get their degree, they had to go back to the original manuscripts and sometimes they like touch the papyrus with the white gloves or whatever and translate from Hebrew or Greek and make a new translation for themselves. That doesn't mean, as you just pointed out, that doesn't mean that if it varies a little bit grammatically or use of a word or whatever from something that we read in church, it doesn't mean that the Catholic Church is mad that you've changed the official translation. But maybe just bring us up to speed a little bit about what that process was like and why the church is even okay with something like that. I mean, I think it starts with the fact that a translation is not an exact one-to-one -one science. It's not math, and there's always a little art and nuance into any translation. That's right. That's right. And one of the surprising things so it'd be you like find an artist, out when, be like a different yeah. artist painting a different scene, you know, Bernini's David instead of Michelangelo's David. They're both exactly, David and exactly. slaying the Goliath, yeah. but one looks meaner. The other guy is big. Right. And, and <laughs> e it, even within Scripture itself, you already see that because, you know, as, as most people know, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. But when the apostles wrote the New Testament in Greek and when they when they quote the Old Testament, they're quoting a Greek translation of the Old Testament that already existed which was basically the Bible of Jesus and the apostles was the Greek Old Testament. And when you just comparing the Hebrew and the Greek right there in your own Bible, you'll you can yeah. see the kinds of difference in nuance, which actually makes it kind of fun, because then when you take into account the Latin, et cetera, you can see the range of meanings that are available. Now, I'll be the first to say my translation is not meant to replace your favorite Bible it's not meant to replace what we use in the lectionary or in the divine office. But if you have, you know, if you have Psalms in your favorite translation that are so poetic that you find it hard to understand what the psalmist is talking about, you know, there are places where where I've actually sacrificed a little bit of the poetry for more clarity. And so comparing the two might help you understand. Or, or if I may, and not to toot your horn for you, but it's, some of the Psalms are so familiar, as with a lot of the words of Scripture, that they tend to kind of just roll past us as just we don't notice them. Or, or we're, we're, it's so much religious jargon that we're like, oh, yes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then, okay, well, what are we really saying with that? In verdant right. pastures, yeah. he gives me repose. Oh, that's beautiful. I hear it at every yeah. funeral. What does that mean? So, I mean, yeah. to, to have a new translation that maybe switches up a word or phrase here and there, you go, wow, that gives me a whole new angle on it. And you're not, you know, doing offense yeah. to the text. That's right. I tried to I tried to defer to words that we would actually use in yeah. in our speech. Now, that doesn't mean I've, you know, turned it into a paraphrase or anything like that. Right. Um, but I have tried to sort of use words that we generally use and we know what they mean. And um, but, but yeah, like the example yeah. that I just gave of the 23rd Psalm, which a lot of people are familiar with and it's beautiful. Like, I don't usually say when the show is over to Brett and uh, Krista, I need repose now. I'm going to right. I'm done with the show. I'm going to repose. <laughs> Maybe well, even even the phrase I shall not want. I shall like, not want, Brett. I am full. I will have I, have I will have what that. I need. I you know? that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we don't talk. It's that. it's. Um, you know, sometimes the Bible can be almost a little Shakespearean to us, you know? Right, exactly. So that's one of the values here. Before I let you go, um, when we talk about contemplative prayer, we defined Lectio Divina well. You mentioned before, there, it's, it's 
somewhat de rigueur for people to say, well, pr prayer should be more about listening. And maybe people associate contemplative prayer with that, just kind of like being very quiet, spending 20 minutes, maybe nothing happens and that's okay. How, how does this and the Psalms that you've given us new translations of and this process of a prayerful reading, how does it allow us to enter into contemplative prayer? Well, the book will will lead readers in that direction. It, it won't bring you all the way to contemplative prayer because that's a that's a bigger issue. And, you know, of course, the mystics would say that contemplative prayer itself is a gift that not everyone receives. So you hmm. should not beat yourself up over the fact that if you haven't discovered contemplative prayer yet, that that's OK. But or the if you've book tried will... and tried and tried. And... Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, but the book will move move the reader in that direction because uh, the 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 practice of Lectio Divina leads into something um, that developed in, in the later centuries of the early church, which is a breathing prayer and the Jesus prayer. And so uh, by using these short prayers, repeating them and and if the reader chooses to uh, breathe through them, that's sort of the a step on the way to contemplative prayer. And um, and in fact, you know the the way the way that personal devotion develops in, in the church is that that leads us right into the rosary, actually. And so uh, the the rosary becomes, although it's not the rosary doesn't exist in the early church; it's medieval. But the rosary is the next phase of development. Uh, in this thing called personal devotion. And um, and so you you can see that in the book. And then, um, you know, I've got the other book coming out in the spring, Praying Like the Early Church, that is going to flesh that out even more. So. But when you, when you mention the rosary, e even just the, the quick summary of it, 150 psalms, and essentially if we do five decades of 10, that's 150. That they were initially, back when the rosary first came to be, it, those who were illiterate and couldn't crack open or couldn't afford, as you said, a nice freshly copied by a monk after 10 years version of the Psalms and sit there and under a tree and read them, that uh, the very least, I guess they know, oh, there's 150 Psalms. I hear them every morning. They're going, oh, they're reading, they're praying them. I want to do like they do. So this is, became at the very beginning just a, a way to mimic what was going on in the monasteries, mimic the praying of the Psalms. Even if you didn't know what the words were, didn't know how to read, you still kind of went through the 150 on your beats. Yeah. And you, you know, uh, if someone was illiterate, they substituted the Our Father and they just prayed the Our Father 150 times, which, you know, some people might find that tedious, but at least it tells you this, that, you know, historically in the church, there was no opposition to repeated prayer. There, mm -hmm. you know, there was no aversion to the idea of a shorter prayer repeated over and over again. That was actually preferable to just going on and on. Not that you can't pour out your heart to God; you certainly can. But um, you know, this is this. But, but is, it's a better yeah. substitution for what the rest of our potty mouth does the rest of the day. So let's just do 150 Our Fathers. You know, at least that's yeah, better than yeah. the other and option. Then, <laughs> from the Our Fathers to the Hail Mary, and there you go. You got the Rosary. <laughs> Well, I think we'll we'll continue this historical discussion in the spring when your new book comes out. I would love to. Thanks. Now, of course, I have to at least suggest that if you do release your own fully translated by you Bible, you should call it the King James Papandrea version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, King might be a little might be a little stretch, although I, I like to think I am the king in my own household, but it doesn't really go too much guess. farther than that. King so <laughs> okay, fair enough. Now, Brad, I don't know if you noticed, right before Jim came on, we talked about a fun thing you're going to be doing, judging uh, Etouffee cooking contest. At some point during the interview, Jim described as fun, well, you know, like, it's cool kind of comparing the Latin version, and then, then you get out the Greek and look at that and see what the differences are. <clears throat> Probably yeah. not a lot of people. Yeah, I don't know how scholastic <laughs> my reviews are going to be, particularly up against King James Papandrea. So I'm going to have to work on my verbiage. And just hit him with contest. the etymology of the word etouffee. And that'll oh, go there you go. Oh, I got a lot of research to do. Trust yeah. me, I wish you had a book out on this. Well, that would be great. He's got that two is, Whatever that language okay. is, it's not one that I've ever studied. I think that's it. <laughs> That's a well, Creole French? or something. Come on, you, know, you probably French? did a little French. I did a little French. I did yeah, have to that? read a little French in my. Uh, like, I okay, forgot more me. French than I ever <laughs> learned, me. but oh well. You know, it's fun. I got my Latin and my Greek in one hand. I got the French in the other. That's kind of fun. All right, Jim, Bob, and Dre, we love it when you come on and explain stuff to us. Come on back soon. I'd love to. Thanks a lot. It's been a blessing.